Um, and it's just something special about acknowledging what God's doing in your life or what he has done. And when you do that, it stirs up positive emotion. It stirs up the positive expectancy, which is hope that God's going to do something amazing in your life. And so don't, don't, um, don't dismiss what he's already done. Our key scripture today is Luke chapter 2, verse 52. 252. If you went to Triple C, which none of you did <laughs> here, but if you went to Triple C, this was our motto, to grow in wisdom and in stature with favor with God and man. So this is the fourth F. This is the last F of the teaching, favor. And so Luke 252, the pastor translation says, and Jesus grew, so did his wisdom. As Jesus grew, so did his wisdom and his maturity. Oh, thank God for those two words being in the same sentence, wisdom and maturity. And it says, the favor of men increased upon his life, for he was loved greatly by God. The favor of men increased greatly on his life because he was loved greatly by God. Let me pull up in the King Jimmy where I memorize it from and see what Uncle King Jimmy says. Sometimes I just love, you know, I go back and forth because I go back to what I memorized it in. And in the New King James Version or the King James Version, it says this. It says, um, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So it makes sense how the Parson translation did it, right? He's saying because of God's great love for him, he was increased in favor with men. And so favor, if we were going to give it a definition, this is how I would describe favor. I would describe favor as an area of your life where your gifting, expertise, life experience, and more has the highest impact and influence on people. So when you think about it, the area of your life where you're gifting, what you're good at, your expertise, your skill sets, you probably went to school for something, probably just have a passion for it, your life experience, so your collective exposure, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all wind into your skills, has the highest impact and influence on people. So, for example, Dom is an a interior designer. You know, She can see something that I cannot see and recommend a color or recommend a furniture or recommend something, but she needs to partner with your vision to make your dream come true. You need to give her something to work with in a space. She can naturally gift that up and tell you how to improve your living or working space. That's her gifting. She has experience in that. And then people who invited her to do work, she has impact and she has influence. There's also maybe a hobby that you may have that may do the same. You know, for me, um, I would say that I, I like communication. I like preaching God's word. And, and I have the ability to break down complex things in God's scripture so that people could understand. I also like to encourage people. So I feel like I'm a good encourager. Sometimes I need to encourage myself in the Lord. But, but I find like if I hear somebody struggling and they're open, I could find a way to direct them and encourage them and, and, and find God's love and God's encouragement for them to push them through or have them pause in his presence and be transformed. I have that ability. I'm also good with numbers. So I can see things, things through numbers that people can't see. So wherever you have your gifting is, 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 is maximized, your expertise is maximized, and your life experience wrapped into one, in that area of your life, that's where you have the highest impact and the highest, highest influence with people or on people. Another way of saying is that whatever you're known for, you know, we're talking about branding now. We're in the social media world. What are you known for? What are you known for? What are you known for? You know, if you go to a restaurant right now, what's your favorite restaurant? And you could tell me what you like about that. What are they known for? What's your favorite hotel? <laughs> what are they known for? This could have a positive thing and a negative thing. Because if you took on in it from a consumer, you're drawn to a business because of the positive things they're known for and the positive experience you have, but then you're drawn away for the negative. So if that's a business, as a consumer, that's also people and relationships. What are you known for? Well, that person is known to gossip, so I woo, can't tell them nothing. What are you known for, man? That, that person, every time I had a struggle, 
and I lean to them, I've never heard it on the road. I can trust them. What are they known for? Man, that person always gives me good wisdom that I have seen, you know, have seen change my life once I adhere to it. At least elements of it. Wow. Oh, that person always tells me untruth. Oh, that person always lying. What are you known for? And so when you begin to steward favor in life, what you're actually doing is maximizing the positive things that you're known for to attract the true value that you have. So when you pay somebody to do something for you, when you pay them $500 an hour, $300 an hour, or whatever the project is, and you're looking at their expertise, you're looking at their life experience, you're looking at their impact, what you're actually saying is that they are known for this. So they had to grow in wisdom. They definitely had to grow in maturity. And when they're walking in life, purpose for them, God's love is on them, so they're getting favor with everyone or with people. So think about that. What are you known for? When people say your name, what do they recall about you? It's very important to be doing an assessment of self in this area, right? Because it's not about bad and good. It's about all about growth, right? So here are some things we must remember when we're growing in favor. When we're growing in favor, we have to remember that observation is key. Now, this is a hard word for me because I'm a person like this. I think I know everything, but I think, especially if I have experience in something. So it takes me a little while, and when I say a little while, until I fail, to realize that I, there's a lot more to know. So once I fail, then I am in observation mode. I am in the mentor, mentee mode. I am in the humble mode for a long time. Until I have a lot of notches of victory so that I can get, not, I'm not, not, not that I lack confidence, but then I go back to like, okay, now I'm going to add value. I can create the culture now because I've lost some, I've won a lot, and I think my collective experience, it gives me direction to be an advisor now. At least I hope if you're here. But go, starting, starting out, no, I know everything. But the Bible talks about Jesus coming on the scene at 30 years old. We know of him getting lost at 13. Anybody 13? No, no, they're 14 now. They're 14. We know of him getting lost and Mary losing him and Joseph looking for him. And Mary and Joseph find him in the temple. And he being a smart addict, which most teenagers are, don't you know I will be in my father's house? <laughs> All right. All right. We'll make your father feed you then. <laughs> you, 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 you know? But we don't hear nothing more about Jesus until his baptism. When John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the earth. Something funny because we don't know if John and Jesus ever had a bond before that. We could only speculate, speculate. But we do know that while Mary had Jesus in his belly, and John's mother Elizabeth had John in her belly, the Bible says her womb leaped. Her womb leap because of the presence of that Mary carried. The word that became fresh that Mary carried our Messiah connected with the calling of John life. Is it that John felt that same leap? Isn't that John got a revelation? Behold. Because John would have been fasting. He would have been praying. He would have been looking for something. And all of a sudden, he sees what he felt. Sometimes that's how you know it's God. You've been feeling something. And all of a sudden, you saw it. If you ever go shopping for property, that's how you know you that your property. You feel it. You know something inside of you. And then all of a sudden, you see it. Oh, in my dream. This will be good. I had a guy come to the church. We call him Iron Man. He had lost two legs. And he, he, he was an addict before he became known to Jesus. He's about 60 now. And he went to Vietnam. And, you know, he has PTSD. And he struggled as a young man. And he lost his, his leg eventually, his legs, right? And um, he was here when we were doing some ministry. And, he, and when he walked in, I didn't know it at the time. But when he came to Cayman, he got a dream of a place to worship. And the floor was this pattern. 
He had a floor, and he, he like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. And when he testified that day, he said, Felix, when we went to breakfast, you wouldn't know it. But when I turn my heart to God, there's a, there's a, there's a song. It's, it's called Iron Man or Iron Giant or something like that. And he actually, when God met him, he was on a mountain. He was thinking about suicide. He was thinking about all this different stuff. And he shouted out to God. And he's like, oh, why are you making me an Iron Man? Like, why are you making me, like, hard? Like, he said, boy, you, you don't know what you said when you called me Iron Man. Then he told me about the story about the floor and about God has a plan. Observation is key. Jesus steps into ministry at 30 years old, but for about 20 years at least, he's observing his culture. He's observing what's right and what's wrong. He's seeing people being misused and justice not occurring. He's seeing spiritual leaders abuse the system. I mean, he, walked, he, he saw these things on a daily basis, but didn't say nothing until the time was right. If you're going to grow in wisdom, God is going to expose you to many things that are wrong. He don't want you to say nothing about it yet. He want you to grow in your skill. He want you to grow in your anointing and your life experience. And while you're doing that, he wants you to create a strategy of positive change that would shape the world. But not yet. So if you're going to grow in wisdom and in stature with God, and God, with God and man, you have to go through the process of waiting. Because you have to know your audience. And you also have to know what your audience's major problems are. And you have to create those solutions that will catalyze or shape positive change in their life. So right now you might feel confused, but maybe God has got you observing. And you might not know whose office you're in, and the wisdom that's being shared, and the information that you're exposed to. Just hold it tight, because God can call you to be an advisor. And when you're an advisor, you get the good and bad of information, and you got collectively come together and consult and make a positive decision. That's when the Bible said Jesus went to wilderness, and he prayed all night so that he can choose disciples so that he can do life with them. He knew he needed diversity in order to have impact. He knew everybody couldn't be Peter. Could not everybody would come to church if Peter greeting you at the door. Peter would cut you <laughs> and pray for you at the same time. He knew everybody can't be like Thomas. But they said, Down Thomas, can't be flaky, can't be up and down. He knew everybody can't be like John. And it was like, oh, just love everybody. Just love everybody. He needed diversity. Because he needed to be aware of his audience and what they were going through. So when he calls people like sheep, and he says they're like sheep without a shepherd, he's saying sometimes leadership is what changes everything. And not that people are not there to fight. Not that people are not there to be in a line. Not that people don't have no skills. But what they're really looking for is people that care for them before they begin to share with them. People that would feed them when they're hungry and not try to run them when they're hungry. If you ever see a hungry man, even a glass of water, the Bible says, is something positive to do for anyone that's thirsty and hungry. So I'm just sharing these things because I believe every one of you are going to grow and are, is already growing in, in wisdom, but observation is key. Don't be hasty like me. I mean, I was, man, I was a, when I got called to be a pastor, I was 21. And I remember Pastor Allison saying, blossom where you're planted first. Blossom where you're planted. Because I want to resign. I mean, in my mind, I want to resign. I want to buy a bicycle. I want to go to the hospital and pray for people. Because God had got a hold of my heart. And him in his wisdom would say, Felix, just wait. Just wait. And so I just took the, um, stayed on for about 14 months with the bank. And then I got a little seminary diploma. And then things were in line. Because he could see that things were going to be lined up for me. But not yet. So that was tough to wait. And then it's also tough when life changes, but you still have a calling. You ever been misplaced, but still a king? So David had to be called misplaced and still learn about leadership. 
it's funny because if you read in the book of Samuel, the first group of people that came to him, the Bible says was his family that found him in the cave, and then those that were in debt, those that were discouraged, and desolate. Wow. So God, how are you going to start a church? I'm going to put people in debt. I'm going to bring people that may be discouraged. God, how are you, how are you going to start a business? Well, some people might come that but you won't have to see that they're diamond in the rough and you're going to have to whip them into shape and you're going to have to lead them. And the Bible talks about David mighty men that when David said that he was thirsty for a drink from the water of the well in Bethlehem and in order to get to Bethlehem, his soldiers, two soldiers had to go to an army. Man, God, make us like David soldiers that when you call us, that you can give us wisdom and the ability and the agility to tr go through an army to just get a drink. But they weren't always like that. The Bible says this about Paul and Barnabas. It says the men that have transformed the world and turned the world upside down has now reached our shores. I'm saying this thing because God who called you has absorbed you before you answered the call. And he sees something inside of us. The very thing that we want to get rid of. The very thing that we want to cut out and put a new patch. It's like if you want to do transplant. If you had surgery, it will mess up on this side. And I got to take a piece of skin, draw from over here to put on this. No, God is like, leave the scar. Because the scar means you went through something. And the scar is a reminder that you might, be hurt, you know, you might get hurt but you'll heal. And so Jesus is doing this, and, and, and as he called people, and as he transforming people, he's seeing that I have to be patient, I have to be observant, I have to give him a chance, because just like how I grew with you, Lord, they need to grow. You know, you, we could be fully aware of what God has called us to do and still have doubts. You don't believe that? Go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there's any way possible <laughs> that I don't have to be crushed again. He's in a wine press being crushed in the spirit. He's, his enemy is there because you know, the enemy is still taunting him. You know. The angels are there as well. Sometimes we forget when, sometimes we just get so caught up in the darkness that we don't realize in order for the darkness not to consume us, there has to be light there. And so he's in the garden, and he's crying out to his father, Father, if there's any other way, yet yeah, not my way, but thy will be done. He goes through a crushing. So how can Jesus fully know what he's called for, still saying yes, but going through his challenges? And if Jesus had to call on the Father and say, yo, help me out in my worst time, when we go and chew our garden or get seminary, when we get in squished, squeezed in the olive grove, when we get impressed by life's pressures, we too have the ability to say, God, uh, it's not good. But not my will, your will be done. So, how do we grow in favor? Well, the first fast track, well, the first thing I would list how you grow in favor is solve a problem. If I'm a leader, and I own a business, I run a department, I'm looking to start something. I'm trying to figure out who is going to solve this problem. Now who will come add to the problem? Now who will come and tell me that we have a problem? Because trust me, Houston knows they have a problem. A company knows when they're leaking money. A company knows when they need new people or revived people to turn the culture around. A company knows. A leader knows. So when a leader is looking for people to come on board, what the Bible said, Jesus prayed all night, went to the wilderness, and then choose 12 from amongst the crowd. There's always more people available to do the job than those that are called to do the job. The problem is, is that we, like the house of Jesse, have this complex because people look good on the outside. They made for it. Seven brothers came, and Samuel had to say, no, the Lord not with them. Do you have another son? Is there another son? <laughs> the Bible says he was a sheep shepherd. He rid the sheep, and sheep don't smell good. I don't know if you've been to a farm. And sheep, you got to get close to guide them because they don't got no sense. 
Because we are all like sheep and went astray. So let me call the guy that nobody wants in the house because he stink. Let me get the guy that's doing the job that nobody wants to do because everybody too egotistical to do it. And let me bring it in my presence. And if the Spirit of God resonates with me in the presence of this guy, God will tell me that he looks on the heart when everybody looks on the outside. I'm telling you, when God calls you, you may not look called or perfect for that job but in all that, all that space of influence but God sees something on the inside that your people can't see yet and it's only when you're in position that you begin to move in your anointing okay you don't believe me if you go to the book of Judges what's that guy named that <laughs> what's that with a G Gideon Gideon was against a big army that outnumbered the sun on the seashore. Gideon was pressing wine in, in a wheat area. So he's wrong produce in the wrong place, hiding because he didn't want people to take his food. God calls Gideon, and Gideon assembles an army. I need 10,000. Now 10,000 against a million is still far-fetched, but at least I got more than one. And God breaks them down, I think, to 300, the Bible says. And he uses this. He says, anybody that comes and gather the water from the river or the lake or wherever they were, and be attentive, meaning they put their hand down and bring it up and drinks it like that, that's the person. And only 300 did that. What are you saying? How are you going to go to war, right? And your head down inside is, we are on the battlefield. Your head is focused on one thing. When you're at war, you have to be aware because the enemy can come in any direction. You see, God is aligning us with some people that's going to be on our north, going to be on our south, going to be on our west, going to be on our east. And they're going to be people that are in battle, that are going to see things from afar. And God's going to speak to them and they're going to bring the information to us. And they're going to help us as the generals in their life. And they too are generals, but in this area, we're the leaders. And we're going to say, wow, I didn't see that coming. Let's get together. And God is going to give us a victory without us even fighting. Because it was, it, was, it was as if he said, listen, God will make you win by just giving the next person a dream. He sends scouts. Gideon sends scouts. Read it in the book of Judges, like chapter 5, or say, he sends scouts down just to hear what the enemy is speaking. You see, sometimes we've got to be able to camouflage as Christians. We don't camouflage because if we wear all the cross and Jesus and this and this so much, people read it like, okay, hold on. They're not going to speak the way they need to speak so that we can get the information that we need. So all of a sudden, they get close, just close enough to hear by a tent. And he said, last night I had a dream. And in that dream, we were all overtaken by this light and this, this, and the fire spread and da, 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 all kinds of things through the tent. And all of us died and all kinds of different stuff. And one of the interpreters of the dream, the enemy interpreter, <laughs> dream now and says that's none other than Gideon and the Lord's army come to kill us oh my god so what does Gideon do I think he puts a, 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 a fire or like a like a like a lamp or something like a open fire puts it on um, an animal and make the animal run through the camp and when the people who interpret the dream who are just speaking about it, sees that none other than the dream coming true. This is Gideon coming to kill us. And all of a sudden, confusion breaks out and the enemies kill themselves and destroy themselves. Sometimes we gotta get close enough just to listen. Don't tell people you're coming sometimes. Just just knock on the office sometime. Just catch people by surprise sometime because the, the true purpose and the true heart would will show up. So the fast track to, to favor is to solve a problem, create a solution. How do you grow in favor with your spouse? You solve a problem. How do you grow in favor with your boss? You solve a problem. How do you grow in favor with government? You solve a problem. Government got a lot of problems to solve. Pick one, champion one, and watch favor grow in your life. Remember what I said earlier, favor, I described favor as an area of your life where your gifting and expertise and life experience all come together to have the highest impact and influence on people. So my question is, what are you known for? Is it for solving problems or creating them? I got some family members that, boy, love them to death, you know, but I can't, I can't be around them too long because I hear more problems than solutions. And I live by this thing. 
so, and when you want to help people, whether it's family or friends, you have to see if they're a part of their own solution. They have to be a part of their own salvation. They have to be a part of their own rescuing. I can't pay for the boat. I can't pay for the rescue team. I can't risk everything for you to still be in that spot and don't choose to jump in the boat. No, no, no. You have a coordinate. You have to buy a ticket or something. You have to do something because where there's a lack of investments, there's a lack of resolve. The reason why I fight for certain relationships, because I'm fully invested. If I'm not invested, I'm not going to fight for it. Let's be honest. So we need to find a point of investment first before you can find a point of resolve. That's why reconciliation happened. That's why the boy went back home. The prodigal son went back home because he realized how much his father invested. He wanted all his wealth from his father. Pretty much he's saying, Father, I wish you were dead so I can move on and live all my life. Your father said, you want to I were dead? Okay, cool. I'll give you what is yours while I'm alive. He never had wisdom to steward what God blessed him with. And when the father finally saw his son come back, they're both equally invested. He runs and he rescues, he reconciles, he put a ring on him, he changes his clothes, he puts shoes on him, he gets a fattened calf, he does a party. Then the miserable brother that barely doing enough, that wanted to leave but didn't have the guts to leave, finally said, well, you didn't even give me a goat. You didn't give me my friends a goat. He said, son, you can't even see. Well, you're here all the time, and I love you so much, but your, son, your brother who was lost is now found. God know who really for him, you know. God know who really for him. So guys, solve a problem. Value people. Valuing people is a big key in growing in favor. Don't, don't just see what people could do for you. Just value them before they do anything. You know, buy a little, we got Starbucks here, buy a little gift card and say thank you. You know, send a little message. Say, I know you, you lost your mother, you lost your father. You're going through something. Just let them know you're, you mean you're valued. I didn't know that was going on in your life. You, you said it in the, in the break room. I'm so sorry. You got a divorce. Don't need to know the facts. Bless you. We need to grow in favor because we need to grow in impact and influence. And one how we do that is we steward the gift of God in our life so that when an opportunity comes to bless, we can bless. And the blessing always breaks the curse. Blessing always breaks the curse. What does valuing people look like? Think about it in your life, in your own area. What does valuing people look like? It is also good to know that our gift works everywhere, but guess what? It works somewhere best. So you might be good at something right now, but if you find the right place where it works, that's where it begins to explode. Your growth and your fear begins to explode. So if Jesus grew, guys, in wisdom and in favor with God and man, don't you think we should as well? We should. So anybody that has a track record of breaking relationships, breaking relationships, break, I'm not talking about breakup, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about student health. If I can call somebody's name and say, you know, Felix, oh, he don't go to this church no more now. But while he were here, he was great. Did he leave in any problems? No, really. He had a meeting with us. He talked to us. He blessed us. He even told us that he was so into our ministry until he found another church. Wow, that sounds like somebody I would do leadership in ministry. Really, I didn't know. But if I heard, man, Felix, hmm. <laughs> He couldn't wait to damage our name. He couldn't wait to say this about us. He couldn't wait. You know, some people, when they leave jobs, they're like that. So, and sometimes when they leave people, like, come on, your wife couldn't be that bad. Your husband couldn't be that bad. You were with them unless you that blind. So, just be careful how you exit relationships because how you exit also dictates how you grow. So, that, that you got to be wise. So if Jesus grew in favor, we need to go. How, how are we minimizing our favor? One way, area I said is, is, is problem solving. Lack of problem solving you really minimizes your favor. If you're going into a big meeting, you kind of have an idea of what it's about. They give you kind of like a meeting note. Just figure out, don't say nothing with nobody, but if it comes up, if they have a question about something, how do you think we should go ahead? Have that answer, a little sketched out. Pray about it, find it out. So that when the opportunity presents, do not put your foot forward unless the opportunity presents. When the opportunity presents, share pieces of the solution. When I say piece, you know why? Because an architect always draw the plans, but he don't really release your plans until you pay for it. <laughs> so, make sure whatever you create, you get to be responsible for. 
Make sure they partner with you in your creation because many times God will want you to partner, but sometimes we share too much and all of a sudden it becomes somebody else's idea. You ever been there before? Oh, yeah. So let's reclaim some of that and let's move forward. So I want to encourage you today as we think about favor. We talk about a lot of things, but I think about growing in favor, man. Just, just first observe. What can I do to be a blessing? Or do I need to be a blessing here? Maybe this is not my thing. Let me just observe. I know sometimes when people visit the church and they I walk in the vault right away. And I'm like, no, 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 wait like six, seven weeks. If you're still here after six or seven weeks, then we can talk. But if you're gone after two weeks, then I... <laughs> You can't go in favor. You can't go in wisdom. And so as, as, as you observe, then find out, wow, how does my gifting, how does my influence, how does my, sorry, how does my expertise, how does my skill set, at what level can I make an impact? I might be middle management. I might not even be management. I might be a filing clerk. How do I make an impact? But well, guess what? Those files need to be categorized properly so that when leadership needs it, they can find it. Amazing. They need to be scanned in our system so that we can just pick a button and we can see it. It need to be in a database. It need to be data protection. You know how important a file and clerk is in today's age? Wow. So no matter who you are, God has a calling in that. Then take your time and grow. I was watching a video this morning and the guy was doing real estate training and he said, um, he pulled a guy, let's say the guy's name is Jose, and he said, pulled Jose, and he said, Jose, between a 1 and um, 0 to 10, what leader are you, like right now in your field, in, in this sales, you know, I think it was like a car dealership, and this car dealership, where you are as a salesperson, I'm a 10. And before he said that, the guy said, I think you're a 2. What do you think you are? He said, I'm a 10. He said, well, Jose just told us that he's not growing no more. Because if you're a 10, then you have maximized, and there's no way you could be a 10 because the industry is always changing. Customers' needs are always there. So he goes back after saying that for like a minute. He says, Jose, what's your true number right now in leadership? A three. <laughs> okay, now you're being honest. Hey, nothing wrong with a three because you're hungry. And the Bible says those who hunger and thirst shall be filled. So if you have maxed out and you're no longer hungry to go and you're no longer hungry to go to wisdom or favor or anything, then God is going to choose the hungry. Your boss is going to choose the hungry. The next meeting is going to call the hungry. Because if you filled and you kicked back, I can't teach you anything. Don't be like me. I tell you, <laughs> I come in there, bam, 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 and I fail a couple of times. And I, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I need to be back in observation mode. Because I, I, I observe, I'm learning from other people's mistakes. The proverb said, as a wise man learn from other people's experiences. So when that person is sharing failure, I would sit and hear failure, not to be in a position to know about somebody, but to learn. I'm looking for what I can learn. So that marriage didn't work because of what? Oh, okay, I can fix that. That friendship didn't work because of what? Okay, that business didn't work because of, okay. So when I get an opportunity to look into the, the many prongs of my life and say, as a father, how did that relationship break down with the children? As a husband, how did that relationship? As a pastor, wow, ooh, I could have seen this coming if I had just listened to the wisdom that was available. Remember now, there's victory in the multitude of wisdom, of counsel. So Father, I thank you for this day. I bless this church and its people.